Welcome to 1 Samuel 19, verses 1 through 24. I've entitled this, Protecting David is a Family Affair. We'll find as, as Saul attempts to kill David fail, uh, David is forced to become a refugee, but there's an awful lot of people helping him along the way. Some observations. Okay. Excuse me. The themes from chapter 18, which we covered in the last lesson, continue. Saul's children still love David. In fact, they help protect him. Saul continues to be terrorized by a harmful spirit. Saul continues attempts to kill David. And Saul, who became David's enemy, continually at the end of chapter 18, continues to be David's enemy. There we go. Chapter 19 will tell us that Saul's desire to kill David goes viral. It goes public. He commands others to kill David. It's no longer a secret. And Saul's children, a malfunctioning javelin and the spirit of God protect David from Saul and his desires. So David becomes a refugee in this chapter. If you look at some of the terms, they sound like somebody who's a refugee. In verse 2, it's go into hiding. In verse 10, he eluded. In verse 10, he made good his escape. In verse 11, he runs for your life. In verse 12, he fled and escaped. Verse 17, he escaped. Verse 17, again, he, get, he got away. Verse 18, he fled and made good his escape. So lots of emphasis upon David having to escape Saul's attempts on his life. So let's look at an outline of chapter 19, if you will. First seven verses, Jonathan saves David's life. He makes a case for, for Saul to bring David back and that David is innocent. And verse 8 through 10, Saul is terrorized by an evil spirit, and he attempts to pin David to the wall in his house, but he's unable to do so. Michael saves David's life when Saul sends messengers to watch for David and to bring him to Saul to be killed in 11 through 17. In 18 through 24, Saul pursues uh, David to where Samuel is in Nob or in Ramah and where the school of prophets are and Saul and his messengers are overwhelmed by God's spirit. So let's read these first seven verses. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as before. So there's some reconciliation thanks to Jonathan's defense of David. Well, it begins badly in verse 1 because Saul tells everybody they must kill David. He publicly proclaims his intent. In chapter 18, it was silent. He used other people, the Philistines, for example, to try to kill David. Here, he wants everybody on board. He identifies Jonathan as Saul's son twice in this verse. So he's pulling the uh, father-son uh, guilt trip to drive a wedge between him and David. Saul is sober here. There's no mention of a harmful spirit or provocation by David's successes. So this is 
This is Saul as he really is. What is amazing that it's the king of Israel proposing aloud the murder of God's anointed David, and nobody says anything about it until Jonathan. But Jonathan, the text says, he at the very moment is identified as Saul's son, but he's taking David's part against his father. That's brave. What about Saul's servants? There's no mention of the servant's response. Chapter 16, they recommend David to David as a great help for uh, Saul's uh, tormenting spirits. Chapter 18, they readily approve of David's military successes and root for him. They, del they love him, they delight in him. Well, we find out no more at the moment, but Jonathan delighted much in David in verse second part of verse one. Uh, the term means to experience emotional delight. It expresses the idea of deep affection. It's Saul claimed to have delight in David when he found out that his daughter Michael loved David and Saul thought that might be used to become a snare against David. Well, Jonathan also loved David. We find that in chapter 18 and chapter 20, that that relationship continues. He discloses to David. So he gives information to David about what's going on. Of course, the most important information is that Saul is determined to kill David. Uh, and that Saul tried to pin him to a wall with a spear in verse 10. And then he plans to destroy the city of Kelia because of David in chapter 23 through 10. So all these three verses uh, have the same idea of disclosing or determining. And in most of these cases, it's Saul's plans against David. Well, so Jonathan speaks to Saul about David. Well, David's role in all of this is to be on your guard in the morning. It's imperative. Um, Saul had sent messengers to watch the house when David came out in the morning in verse 11. So the idea is to watch, be on your guard, be careful. And furthermore, David is to stay in a secret place and hide yourself. Again, a command. So be on your guard and hide yourself. Doesn't seem too complicated. What's Jonathan's role in this plan? Well, he's to go out. The eye is emphatic. So Jonathan is taking the main role here. He's to stand beside his father in the field. Elsewhere, it's referred to someone who's in the position of a highly placed and trusted advisor. So he's, he's standing bef beside his father in the field as a trusted advisor. He goes on to say he would hide from his best friend's father at the beginning of his career and from his own son near the end of it in 2 Samuel 17, 9. Uh, and Nehemiah has a similar reference according to Lee Hart. So father is not always trustworthy. Well, Jonathan speaks well of David in verse 4 and 5. He, he makes the charge that killing David is sin against innocent blood. It, was be, it would be unjust, unright. In fact, in this passage, sin is used seven times. So Jonathan is really laying on uh, the guilt trip about how wrong this would be to murder David. Uh, earlier in Deuteronomy 19, one who uh, was a murderer and was not caught um, or was eventually caught, he would be put to death to, to purge the blood of the innocent from Israel. So that reference to innocent blood has a history. Well, the reason that Jonathan gives uh, Saul is that he's not sending at you. In fact, that's mentioned two times in verse four and five, and then in chapter 24, he's innocent. He, this would be the blood of a person who doesn't deserve to be punished. Second reason Jonathan gives is that his deeds have brought good to you. Well, he risked his life and struck down Goliath and nobody else would in the Valley of Elah. For 40 days, Goliath stood up against Israel and only David took the risk and succeeded. Saul had witnessed that the Lord brought salvation to all Israel in this event and was pleased. So Saul admitted that David had done good. 
And it's similar to Saul's proclamation after victory at Jabesh Gilead in 1 Samuel 11, 12 through 15. So Saul recognized that this was indeed the Lord had brought salvation. So it was good that what David had done. So how does, how does Saul respond to this uh, defense of David? Well, he listened to David. We find in the life of Saul, there are times when he depends on the counsel of others at important moments. We find times that he listens to others and is led astray. We find some foolish decisions in chapter 13 and 14. We find some good decisions despite the advice of others when the spirit rushed upon him early in his career. And Vanoy sums it up this way, it would seem that Saul has not yet so hardened in his rejection of God's will for himself and for David that he would no longer listen to good advice and appeals to conscience. So there seems to be uh, some teachability on Saul's part and sensitivity and the conscience, but it will soon pass. So Saul swore. Uh, and the narrator repeats Saul again to emphasize that Saul agreed with Jonathan. Uh, so seems like a reconciliation has taken place. David is brought back to court by Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan calls David. Jonathan gives him information of all things. He brings David to Saul and things are back to normal, isn't it? It's interesting that three times in the same verse, in fact, surprising, it shows the desire of the Arthur to call special attention to Jonathan's nobility of character. So Jonathan is mentioned three times in this passage to emphasize what he has done. Davis gives this as a, as a lesson for us. Amazing how many dilemmas can be resolved if we simply face them and talk them out, or so it seemed. Well, for the time being, at least, according to Bergen, David was spared by the efforts of Jonathan, the man who had perhaps the most to gain from David's death. Think about it. Jonathan was the heir to be if Saul had died and would not be if David survives. How about some application? Well, for David... Proverbs 14.35 comes to mind. A servant who deals wisely has the king's favor, but his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. Saul has reversed this. David, in fact, acts wisely. There are texts further in Samuel that talk about David being wise, but the king does not seem to understand that and acts shamefully. Here it is in 18.5. David's success is described as wise, the same root word, as found in Proverbs 14, uh, a success that brought, brought varied and inconsistent responses from Saul. Yes, sometimes he, it seems as David became more and more successful, Saul became more and more determined to bring David down. Well, Jonathan, he delighted in David's tested by Saul's intentions. It, it worked uh, throughout the story. It is only the good things that David did that aroused Saul's hatred. How unlike the king of Proverbs 14. Peter tells us that Christians should expect the same kind of treatment. When we do good, the Saul's of the world reach for their spears. So unfortunately, that's all too often true. Well, let's go on and look at verse 8 through 10 and see how long this reconciliation lasted. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul and as he sat in his house with a spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Hmm. Well, David was successful. Saul, not so much for the spear. David went out, fought the Philistines, and they fled before him. And this probably caused the flare up in Saul's anger uh, because Saul was jealous of David's war successes. And we have Saul sitting in his house with a spear in his hand, as we saw 
uh, in chapter 18, it's probably not a good idea. When a heartful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, um, and the first reference was in chapter 16, 14, to an evil spirit of the Lord or from the Lord. It comes after Saul had already disobeyed the Lord on two previous separate occasions, chapter 13 and 15, which suggests that ultimately that the evil spirit from the Lord is because of Saul's disobedience, not because of anything that David did. There's a rejection of kingship and harmful spirit occur after the first event with the evil spirit. Actually, the evil, the rejection of kingship and harmful spirit occur after David or after Saul had disobeyed the Lord. So there's same verbs from verse eight. David struck the Philistines, the top of our screen. Saul fights David. Same verbs. David flees and escapes, and he's never to return to Saul. Oh, what about some application, some chastisement? The reality of such spiritual chastisement is shocking to those who see God as a doting grandfatherly gentleman in heaven. That view is false, for as the Bible tells us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10, 31. Saul was a reprobate whose heart had hardened against God. Therefore, of all his problems in life, chief among them was the fierce judgment of the Almighty. Not only would Saul's divided nature not permit him to lead a wholesome godly life, but God would not permit Saul to lead a wholesome godly life. Reminds me of Pharaoh who hardened his heart uh, enough times that eventually God uh, chastised him and set him in that uh, hardness of heart. Well, Jonathan helps David escape in the first seven verses. Then we have the malfunctioning uh, javelin in verse eight through uh, 10. Now we have a wife helping David. Let's read verse 11. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. Michael took an image and laid it on the bed and put it on a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David saying, bring him up to me in bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair at his head. Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Wouldn't you love to have been one of those messengers explaining this to uh, King Saul? Well, David flees home. Saul sent messengers to watch David. On verse one, Saul's servants were recruited. They were to go and kill David. So this is one of the tasks that uh, Saul hoped to see successful. Psalm 59, three says this, before they lie and wait for my life, fierce men stir up strife against me for no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. This Psalm may reflect David's experience. Well, he fled and he escaped home. Think about it. How far did he get from fleeing the court? He didn't even get out of town. At best, this house is on the wall and he's let out of a window to escape. Uh, but he didn't go very far. But it says he made good his escape. And here and in verse 18, it says when David had fled and made his escape. So this story is all about escaping. He drew the direct sequel of David's fled and escaped in verse 10. Now the narrative proceeds along the, the theme of David's escapes from Saul until Saul himself dies on Mount Geboa in chapter 31. So this theme of fled and escape will continue again and again and again as David as Saul continues to pursue David. <laughs> 
why would he flee just to his home? It's still in the city. He's not that far away. Well, Woodhouse suggests this, that David had no reason to think that Saul's madness would threaten him there. Well, at least so far in chapter 18, uh, Saul's ma madness was confined to his court. Well, Michael's first deception, there are two, is a dummy. If you see the picture here, this is an example of a household idol that may have been what Michael used or a bunch of them to disguise uh, David's apparent form in the bed. Well, her warning is in verse 11a. She gives an urgent dialogue, but there's not a word of response from David, only he went off and fled and got away. It's all Michael's doing. Her solution in verse 11 and 12, she lets David down through the window, part of the city wall, perhaps. Where have we heard that before? Maybe Joshua and Acts come to mind. Her teraphim, or household dummy, as shown in this picture, perhaps. Uh, the size is debated. Some think that they're as large as a man, others that they're much smaller, but with clothes and goat hair, they were enough to fool the watchers. One wonders. It gave David enough time to escape. That was the point of it. But what about her idols, her household idols? Did she bring them into the marriage? One suspects. Uh, when we think of Saul's uh, presumption or Saul's actually is Samuel who makes this uh, statement in chapter 15 that presumption is that it's iniquity idolatry um, perhaps there was some idolatry in Saul's uh, family uh, at least 1523 suggests as much and certainly here in chapter 18 there may have been some idolatry uh, and when Saul speaks of Michael as perhaps a snare for David, maybe this was a part of it. One writer suggests that Michael was as much a spiritual rebel as her father. That's Bergen. And there's that reference to a snare to David in chapter 18, verse 21. So the household dummies or household idols, there may have been something that was meant as a snare for David, but turns out to be a snare for the messengers. Later, we find in 2 Samuel that she despises David, who is dancing in a worship, bringing the ark to Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 6.16. 6, so uh, not a good marriage, apparently. Her next deception are lies. He says, David is sick. So she lies to protect David. The passage, like narrative often does in the Old Testament, does not rebuke uh, her for this deception. The point of the passage is to show how narrow an escape David had. It was very close. So moral judgments in the Old Testament, they're not always very explicit. You have to look about the context or some of the terminology and perhaps you'll find something there. Um, David deceives also in chapter 21 and 27 and he intends to commit murder in chapter 25 until Abigail stops him. So he's not exact or exactly a role model when it comes to honesty. Again, the emphasis is upon how difficult David's circumstances were and that through all these difficulties, and in spite of his sinfulness or his lapses, God took care of him, says Payne. Good lesson for us. Well, Proverbs 26, 28 says, a lying tongue hates its victims and a flat flattering mouth works ruin. What's going on here? Well, Colossians 3, 9 also says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. So if the, the narrative does not... Uh, uh, judge the, the deceitfulness, certainly Proverbs and Colossians do. So what's Saul's response to Michael's deception? Why have you deceived me? That sounds like hypocrisy, because uh, Saul is known for his deception with regard to both of his daughters and many other things. 
Saul has deceived David about Saul's daughters, says Butler. And now Saul's daughter deceives Saul about David. Saul had tried to make Michael a snare, verse 1821, for David, but instead Michael became a snare for Saul. Maybe it's payback. Michael's response to Saul was another lie. And let my enemy go. He thinks Michael should have betrayed her husband so Saul could kill him. He thinks Michael should give help to the murderer instead of to the innocent. Good point. The, the morality here of Saul is just completely reversed. Saul's plots stop by family. In verse 1, it's Jonathan, but this time it's Michael. Well, was it justified to lie to protect in it, the innocent? Many of you may remember Corey Timboon's book, uh, The Hiding Place, uh, where uh, they faced uh, in occupied Holland, I believe it was, uh, hiding Jews from the Nazis. Uh, they had to decide what to do. Well, Corey's sister believed that if a Jew were captured because she had answered truthfully, God would nevertheless protect him and or simply because she had been faithful and honest. Um, it turns out eventually that at least one Jew was killed that she had uh, not hidden or had answered truthfully about. Corey put it this way, though they did not approve of deception, it was better to accept the guilt of lying and to ask forgiveness quickly than to turn Jews over to the Nazis. Tough question. It would have been a tough question for Michael as well. Uh, was it justified to lie to protect David? Well, in Michael's case, she's got plenty of practice with her own family um, as far as lying. So something to think about. Well, there are lots of Psalms that are linked to David's experience. I just want to stop for a moment and talk about them. Out of the 150 Psalms, there are 13 that have information that refer to events in the life of David. And you see on the screen, Psalm 3, 7, 18, 34, 51, 52, 54, 56, 57, 59, 63, 142, all make reference to events in David's life. There are no other historical references that make uh, references to other lives. So this pretty much stands out. David is responsible, according to the titles in Psalm, for about half, 72 of the 150 Psalms. So, for example, in Psalm 59, the title says a mictam of David when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. So, uh, however the Psalms were composed or, or edited, uh, this particular Psalm uh, referenced this experience that we're facing here in 1 Samuel 18. It's probably the earliest of David's events, according to all these titles. What is interesting is when you look at your English version compared to the Hebrew version, the verses are off because the Old Testament assigns a verse number to the title. So where our verse one starts, they have verse two. And the English versions use italics in the titles as if maybe they are not part of the original text. They may have been added later. We don't know uh, what we do know that whatever um, Old Testament texts we have and the Hebrew, uh, the titles are there. We don't have examples of Old Testament texts without those titles. Um, we know that uh, in the Greek translation, sometime in the second century BC, uh, many of these technical terms that were part of the titles they didn't know, they didn't know the meaning of them. So the titles were much older than that. And we find in the New Testament that there are a number of places where David is spoken of as the author of Psalms that are quoted, uh, where the title of the Psalm matches what the New Testament refers to them as, if that makes sense. So you can see there are a number of them in the Gospels and in Acts and in Romans 4. Uh, it's a fascinating subject, a little bit too much for now, but we're beginning to look at David's escapes as well. So I thought I'd throw that in here as well. Um, this is a map, let me move that over. 
of the different escapes of David. We'll look at them in future lessons. We were up here uh, fleeing uh, Saul's court and Gabeah, going up to Ramah. We'll be going up to Ramah where the, to meet Samuel. Uh, and in the next chapter, we'll go to Nob and you can see how that progresses down through Judah, across into Moab, back over into the Philistines. So quite a bit of warnings or quite a bit of wanderings, and yet God protects in all of these. So let's look at verse 18 through 24. The Spirit of God protects David. So we have Jonathan, a bad javelin. We have Michael, and now we have the Spirit of God. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramoth and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Naoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is Naoth in Ramoth. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent another mess, other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Sikhu. And he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are Naoth and Ramoth. And he went there to Naoth and Ramoth. And the Spirit of God came upon him also, and as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramoth. And he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it is said, Is Saul among the prophets? Well, David finds protection with Samuel. So David fled and escaped. That phrase, again, we say was used in verse 10, 12, 13. And then they escaped to Jonathan in chapter 20. And then to Asius, uh, king of the Philistines in chapter 21. So again, the theme continues, escape. He came to Samuel. Well, Saul broke from Samuel in chapter 15. We have not heard from Samuel except for David's anointing in chapter 16, verse 13. We don't know anything about their conversation, but we know about the power of prophetic power. At Ramoth, David comes to Ramoth and told all Saul had done to him. That must have been quite a discussion. It was only about two miles from Saul's town of Gabeah. If he was in a hurry, he could have been there in less than half an hour. So. David's still kind of new to this refugee stuff. He flees from the court, makes it to the edge of town perhaps. Now he flees about two miles from Saul's hometown. He has still not managed to go very far. He will go farther. Well, the messengers are outmaneuvered by God's spirit three times. He sends messengers to take David. Um, having failed to take David in his house, now he goes to Samuel's house in verse 20. The messengers saw the company of the prophets prophesying. So they're not hearing the prophesying because these people are uh, rather gymnastic or very physical about their prophesying. And that's brought out here. And there's Samuel standing over them. Perhaps he was wearing a certain robe that distinguished him as a prophet. Uh, as we find in chapter 31, when he's raised by the witch of Endor, uh, Saul recognizes the robe. Well, literally, Saul is standing, holding a position over them. He's overseeing them, as in Ruth 2. The spirit came upon them and they prophesied. It's involuntary. It's incapacitating. It's unique in scripture. The spirit came upon them. It's not that they worked hard to learn how to prophesy and they practiced and then they were able to do it. Well, Saul is frustrated by the Spirit of God. Uh, twice he's been to Ramoth. The first time, uh, looking for donkey, he asked for direction close to well. In fact, the second time, same situation, asking for directions. In the first visit, when he is going to be anointed, he meets a company of prophets. They're prophesying with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre. 
And apparently that's similar to what happens in the second visit as he seeks David. Well, the spear comes upon him in both cases in chapter 10 and chapter 19. So he prophesies in chapter 10 and 19, both visits, but he's still quite a distance from Nath in chapter 19. A cell among the prophets is a phrase that used both times in chapter 10 and chapter 19 when the spirit comes upon him and he prophesies. Um, in chapter 10, Saul is turned into another man. In chapter 19, Saul is left naked, humiliated, incapacitated, and without the spirit. Quite a change between the two visits. Oh, some might say, is this the experience of being slain in the spirit? Uh, Dr. Grunem puts it this way. It's an experience in which they suddenly fall to the ground in a semi-conscious state and remain there for minutes or hours. And perhaps you've seen these on TV or in person. And the sport usually given for them, Revelation 117, when John falls before uh, this theophany or Christophany of Christ, uh, there's Ezekiel falling upon his face when he meets uh, a vision. There's in Daniel 8 and Daniel 10 also cases where Daniel falls down because of what he has seen. There's a lot of criticism for this. The phrase is not found in the Bible. This is this is uh, something that apparently came out of the revivalism in Kentucky in the 19th century. Uh, it's a reaction to a vision or supernatural, like the transfiguration, at least in the Bible. It's not the touch or movement of a speaker. I think that's important. In the Bible, people fall forward on their faces when they are slain, people fall backwards. There's a difference even in the physicality of the of the event. There's no middleman touching or waving involved. And there's very few instances of falling down in the Bible. Uh, so to me, it seems like slain in the spirit is not, not biblical. Well, how about some application? Well, Matthew Henry puts it this way. God showed how he can, when he pleases, strike an awe upon the worst of men by the tokens of his presence and the assemblies of the faithful and force them to acknowledge that God is with them of a truth. How often we forget just how powerful God and how much in awe we are to be of him. Butler adds this. What David did, to put it in the present day vernacular, was to go to God's word and to church in time of trouble. This seems so simple, but how often, but how few do this? When trouble comes, they often quit reading their Bible and also miss church frequently. Yet in time of trouble, we really need to get into the word and to be in the services at church. Amen. So a summary. While well, the summons to murder failed because of the stand of Jonathan before Saul on behalf of David, the spearing to murder failed because of the separation of David from the presence of Saul. The snare for murder failed because of the support of Michael, David's wife, and the searching for murder failed because of the spell of prophesying which came upon Saul and his men. It's amazing how God was able to protect David. And Proverbs 14, 26 says this, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. How true for us as well. Lord willing, next class, 1 Samuel 20. Thank you for listening and God bless.